He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Who is risen? Jesus of Nazareth. The crucified Jesus is the risen Lord. That's the good news reported with the proof that Thomas had devised in our gospel lesson. I have got to see the mark of the nails with which they nailed his hands to the cross. I've got to see them, and I've got to touch them. If I cannot prove that it's Jesus, our Jesus, who was raised, then how can I believe that the crucified Jesus is the risen Lord? The point here is not about the difference between faith and facts, between proven facts and what we believe on faith. The point is about the connection between their Lord and friend and this one who was reported as raised from the dead. It's not about a mighty sign like the miraculous resuscitation that had happened to Lazarus just as Holy Week began when Lazarus was given a temporary reprieve from from that death sentence, which will ultimately claim us all. It's about the connection between this one reported raised from the dead and Jesus. The Jesus they knew. The Jesus who had called them. The Jesus who had taught them about God's love, God's life, God's will, God's ways, with, with images that were drawn from nature with illustrations drawn from everyday life, with life lessons drawn from parables. That's the connection that Thomas wanted to verify so that he might validate and confirm that image of God seared into our minds with that picture of Christ hanging on the cross, with the crucified Jesus nailed there for us as the defining sign and the decisive revelation of who God is, what God's love looks like, and how God gives all that he is, everything that he has, so that we might lay hold of the life that has laid hold of us through Jesus Christ. Now, it's not as if there was some sort of checklist a well-known list somewhere listing all the qualities that a candidate for being the Christ must have if that candidate were to be regarded as the Christ. He's got to be a nice guy, a loving Lord, a good storyteller, great miracles, raised from the dead, and on and on. The disciples lived with Jesus. They worried through some stormy nights with Jesus. They had fled from some hostile crowds with Jesus on more than one occasion. They had listened as he taught large gatherings, small groups, but mostly just them. They came to Jerusalem expecting great things, life-changing greatness, world-changing greatness. And Judas got things started with his betrayal in the garden. Peter spiced things up with raising his sword and hacking off the ear of one of the servants. Things were just about to take off when Jesus said, enough of this. And then he was handcuffed and hauled off before Pilate. And then Herod. And then Pilate again. And he was questioned and beaten, then questioned again and beaten again, condemned to die, crucified, killed, confirmed dead, carried off to an unused tomb, buried in a tomb that was sealed with a stone, with armed guards there to make sure that this crucified Jesus stayed dead and buried. That wasn't what they had planned. It certainly wasn't what they had hoped. 
The enemies won. The powerful triumphed. The disciples did nothing to stop them then. And they could do nothing but accept it now. Which they had, huddled in fear, behind locked doors. For fear that what had happened to Jesus could happen to them. And then the strangest thing occurred. News emerged that the tomb was empty. Hold on. Sure. We'd like to have a second chance, they thought. Of course we want another ending for Jesus. But it could be any number of possibilities unfolding. It could be that the body was stolen. It could be a trap to locate them. It could be insult added to injury. It could be delirious believers hallucinating images of their heartfelt hopes, exposing them to further sacrifice and additional disappointment. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in the slash from the sword in his side, I will not believe these reports. Now you know the context. And now you sense the challenge. Let's make sure that it's the crucified Jesus who has been raised from the dead. And when that connection is confirmed, Thomas knows exactly what to say. My Lord and my God. It's not just that Jesus is risen, which is good news. The resurrection established Jesus as the Christ. He was the revelation of the living God. What that didn't mean was that it was now time for Jesus to take off his temporary costume. Well, now that you know that I and the Father are one, I guess I won't need these nail prints, these marks of suffering and death from the cross anymore. Now I can just remain above it all insulated from suffering, forever safe and secure within the never-ending peace of heavenly bliss. No, that's not it. The crucified Jesus is the risen Lord. The crucified Jesus is the risen Lord. Jesus on the cross will forever reveal the reality of who God is, how much God loves us, and what God does to hold us close. No, no, Pastor. We want the resurrected Christ to be the victorious Lord of all. We want a triumphant Jesus, a triumphant Jesus who rules with might and promises great things for those who follow him. We don't want a God who suffers. We already have enough of suffering in our lives. Give us miracles that make us better. Turn stones into bread so that all can share in the prosperity of the good life we seek. You see, these were the hopes with which the disciples entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But they were extinguished on Good Friday. This is what Thomas is confirming with his proof. A proof that emphasizes the connection between the resurrected Christ and the crucified Jesus. The crucified Jesus is the resurrected Christ. It's not just a simple matter of sequence. First there's Good Friday, but then there's Easter. First comes the cross, which in three short days gives way to the glory of resurrection. 
the cross is more central to the truth of God's love than, than simply serving as an illustration of, of what God did on a day way back when that surprised the world. The point here is that the resurrection enshrines the cross. The resurrection enshrines the cross as the enduring truth about what God's love looks like in a world that's infected with sin. The resurrection shines the light of God's truth on, on what love costs when seeking to embrace sinners. The cross is the key. The cross is the key to understanding what's going on here. God's not seeking out only the worthy, only those who are well-practiced in all the right virtues, only those who know the good and love it, who know what's right and do it. The cross is not trying to show us what love looks like in a perfect world. It shows us what love looks like in our world. The cross shows us what love looks like when it's grace that drives God to seek out sinners. This is the gospel. God gives his love freely and intentionally to sinners on the cross. God gives his all. God gives his life for us, sinners all. The cross isn't just a single blip on the timeline of salvation history. The cross is salvation's moment of revelation. Salvation's enduring anchor. Of all the meditations we heard on Good Friday, the one that bears repeating today is the one that focused our attention on the cross. It was the meditation found in part six of seven on our Good Friday Tenebrae. I've included a copy of that meditation on the back of the written copy of the sermon, which is also available online. With that picture of Christ on the cross, our meditation reads, we now know that God is with us, come what may. Maybe it's a friend battling cancer. Or a loved one struggling with some aspect of this COVID-19 pandemic. Or maybe we have had our share of isolation or illness or, or just a general sense of frustration with the way things are. With that picture of Christ on the cross, we now know that God joins us in the midst of the pain we are often forced to endure. God joins us in the midst of the suffering that afflicts us. We now know that suffering will never again become a sign of God's displeasure with us. Because of the cross of Christ, we now know that nothing can ever separate us from the embrace of God's love. Nothing in life, not even death. Nothing we've done or ever could do. Nothing now, nothing ever can come between the love of God and the people of God. God is with us. Certainly not against us. God is with us now, not down the road, across the way, waiting for things to change, waiting for us to change. God is with us, by our side, on our side. This is what Thomas was looking for and found, that God had found us, that God had embraced us, called us, empowered us, joins us, 
as we share the faith that's in us by living the love that's ours. God's love, freely given, fully ours, to live and to give as we worship and serve in Jesus' name.